This is a download from the BBC. To find out more and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk. Hello. Faith which does not doubt is dead faith, said the Spanish writer and philosopher Miguel de Unamuno. Former Bishop Richard Holloway, presenter of Radio 4's 20-part series Honest Doubt, would doubtless agree. This week sees the end of his series, in which he charted the struggle between religious faith and doubt. Some listeners undoubtedly switched off. I've been really disappointed about what could have been a, a really good series examining doubt and faith and apologetics. And really, it's far more like a one-sided attack on Christianity. And the Church and the Bible and anything Christian getting nothing but unchallenged criticism. But many, many others were in no doubt that Richard Holloway's series was a major broadcasting achievement. Later in the programme, we'll put your views to the feisty Mr Holloway himself. Also this week, some doubt surrounds the revamp of all BBC Radio's websites. Hello, Roger. Hello. Well, with the help of my imaginary computer assistant, I'll be visiting computer controller Mark Friend to find out just what website changes are in store. But first, the silences that are appearing all over the BBC like a rash. Last week, you may remember, we launched Operation Dropout. Following listener reports that programmes were falling off air and correspondents disappearing into the ether with increasing and alarming regularity, we asked you to join us in a sort of 21st century mass observation. Mike Thompson didn't realise there was a problem. He tweeted at BBC R4 Feedback to say, I just thought that the Today programme had gravitated to cutting people off rather than constantly interrupting. Not yet, Mike. Not yet. The feedback listener's response has, as usual, been quite magnificent. Hercule Poirot would have been proud of you. Rob Williams. I spotted a dropped call on PM on Friday the 22nd at 17.22, or thereabouts, during an interview about the Euro. Now here's Guy Hedgeco in Madrid. Hello. Well, Guy Hedgeco in Madrid. I don't know if you can hear us and uh, add the Madrid view. Can you can you hear us, Guy? No, he can't. Well, Pat Archer, uh, Radio Four Today program, twenty seventh of June, six eleven a.m. There has been no real ceasefire in in Syria. Also, the Oops, um, got, calling oh, uh, image, and we've got a problem on the line uh, to Geneva, uh, which is making it impossible to hear you. So we'll, we'll see if we can sort that out. But let's move on for the moment. We heard her all right, but she was sounding <laughs> pretty strange by the end. Mark Heal. Yet another dropout. Radio 4, today programme at 07.54 on the 25th of June. But that kind of gesture would be the sort of reassurance that might help. The other... Um, yeah, we're just getting one or two little glitches on the line there. Good work, spotters. Keep listening. And when our dossier is bulging at the seams, which I don't think will be long, we will hand it over to the BBC and ask, ever so politely, of course, what's going on? And now from technological to more philosophical inquiries. Francis Bacon said, If a man will begin with certainties, he shall end in doubts. That seems to have happened to Richard Holloway. Once Bishop of Edinburgh, he now describes himself as an after-religionist. He has just completed a 20-part Radio 4 series called Honest Doubt. It was subtitled The History of an Epic Struggle. And on what was for radio a pretty epic scale... It sought to explore the relationship between faith and doubt over the last 3,000 years. Richard Holloway explored the work of thinkers and philosophers like Spinoza, but also brought in the work of poets and artists, from Gauguin to Philip Larkin. On the top left-hand corner of the painting, Gauguin has slashed three questions. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? The programmes touched on issues such as the possibility of morality in a godless world and that nagging question, if God does exist, how can he, she or it, allow terrible human suffering? If everyone must suffer in order to buy eternal harmony with their suffering, pray tell me, what have children got to do with it? The series provoked some animated responses from listeners. Here are some of them which we played to the editor who commissioned the series and to Richard Holloway himself. I'm Chris Mawson. I live in South West Wilts. It's billed as a series of personal essays, uh, and this is clearly a controversial and highly personal view. If this were part of a balanced output on religion and philosophy, that would be fine. 
But why is it appropriate that the BBC gives so much consecutive airtime to one figure described as one of the most outspoken and controversial figures in the church? If the Archbishop of Canterbury were given an extended series to himself like this to express what could after all be considered much more mainstream views about doubt and faith, there would probably be an outcry. It would be far more interesting and fair-minded to put this into a dialogue format so that the audience can reach their conclusions based on a real debate. My name's Lloyd Mike. I live in Oxford, and I'd like to say that I found the programme Honest Doubt um, very interesting. Um, I found special comfort in a particular programme uh, around the 13th of June, which talked about the idea of doubt um, being refocused into action by living, I suppose, your life through the following of the example of the behavior of religious figures like Jesus, um, even if one has questions about the facts of their divinity. Elizabeth Sandis. I'm a staunch atheist and pretty out of touch with religious thought in general, but I think it's fair to say that Holloway has sparked a new interest for me in some of the wider religious debates. It's a captivating programme, clearly the product of lots of careful thought. Also, the music which accompanies the programme was very well chosen, which is an added bonus. Hello, I'm James Pennington. I've been really disappointed about what could have been a, a really good series examining doubt and faith and apologetics and... Really, it's far more like a one-sided attack on Christianity with those views challenging the Christian faith given almost in critical coverage and Spinoza on today's episode being a perfect example. And the church and the Bible and anything Christian getting nothing but unchallenged criticism. And it does seem to be always Christianity that's always in the firing line as well. Unfortunately, it's what I expected and feared um, from the BBC and it's not the intelligent, articulate, impartial look at faith and doubt that I'd hoped for. Well, I'm now joined by Jane Ellison, the commissioning editor of the series, and by its author, Richard Holloway. Can I start with you, Jane Ellison? Why did you commission the series and, at such length, 20 episodes of 15 minutes? Well, I, I was very interested in the idea of trying to find a way of exploring uh, some of the thinking that's gone on around um, faith, the existence of God... It, it, these are questions which people have, have wrestled with for centuries uh, and they've been written about in extremely powerful ways and I think I, I was very keen to try and make sure it wasn't just about theology or the history of the Christian church but that it, that it also embraced some of the scholarly thinking, the writing, the poetry uh, which this subject has evoked. Well, Richard Holloway, you've described yourself recently as an after-religionist. Uh, from what perspective did you come at this series? I suppose from an angle of what you might describe as Christian agnosticism, I'm still a religious person. I was in church last Sunday. But I think that we've got into a kind of phony debate in Britain in which you have absolute atheists arguing against absolute believers. And I think that while those are perfectly respectable positions, there is a large middle ground of people who do not, as it were, buy the political perspective of either point of view. They don't find it true to their own existential experience of struggling with these big issues. And as someone who's lived these challenges and these struggles personally, um, it seemed to me that there was a place for what you might describe as a subjective interpretation of these enormous questions. And I think that the beauty of this series was that it didn't adopt an ideological position. It tried to dive into these issues the way a novelist would and express them humanly. So it and wasn't, as some have suggested, a one-sided attack on Christianity. Your aim was not to attack Christian belief. I don't attack Christian Christianity as such. There are many uh, aspects of Christian belief that Christians challenge themselves. Anyone who knows anything at all about Christianity will know how contentious and divisive and controversial it is, even within itself. I mean, take our attitudes to the Bible. Uh, there are many, many different approaches to interpreting the historical veracity of the New Testament. We look at that very honestly. But Jane Ellison, as some, there are some Christians who do think that their faith is picked upon. And, I mean, they point, they're always in the firing line, they think. And Mark Thompson, the Director General, uh, did comment that in the past he said Christianity had been treated less sensitively because it has pretty broad shoulders. To be blunt, nobody could imagine you commissioning a programme about doubt specifically related to Islam. 
Um, well, we did consider uh, how we should think about uh, is- is Islam and whether we should include it in this. Um, and in the end, I think because of the, the where Richard comes from and because of the the expertise that he has, we felt that uh, it was better to to focus on the Judeo Christian tradition. Uh, so it's certainly not something that we that we'd ruled out. All right, but the Christians well, would also but, say that well, you wouldn't have given this to the Archbishop of Canterbury, the, would you, and let him have twenty programs of fifty minutes duration exploring the faith. Well, but I, I just would go on the broader point that you you were making. The I don't think this is is an attack on Christianity, and I think a lot of the correspondence and the letters that we've uh, that we've received uh, from many many people suggests that it was for them a way of thinking about their faith, thinking about their relationship uh, to, to these questions, uh, and didn't really perceive it as a, a direct attack on Christianity at all. I mean, there are very, very moving episodes where the Bible is talked about. Uh, I'm thinking about Job, particularly at the beginning, where I certainly didn't feel that the programme was trivialising or attacking Christianity so, at all. Well, I, I, th- I think the very premise in which you're basing this discussion is faulty. This was no, not I'm an trying to represent the views. I'm trying to represent the views of listeners. And quite a lot of listeners who come from a Christian perspective did think that. Lots of others didn't, lots of others loved it, but there is a constituency, a Christian constituency, that does feel it gets a raw deal from the BBC. I, I, I can understand that because we live in a marketplace of ideas in which Christianity is no longer privileged um, against assaults of this kind. And I think some of the assaults are unfair and unkindly meant, but I think in a secular dem- democratic culture like ours, religion can take it, and religion is big enough to take it. But this was a very sensitive look at religious experience and the experience of doubt is integral to faith it's it's integrated into our understanding of the bible one of the premises of the program of the series was that religion is self-correcting and the way it corrects itself is by skeptical responses to the human response to the possibility of god and one of the things that we did in tracing this trajectory was to show the way that doubt purifies religion of superstition of ignorance and it's very painful of course because you get very um, committed to your particular interpretation of these mysteries but I I defy anyone who listens to this whole series who believes that it was an attack on religion I'm obsessed with religion I'm a deeply religious person it's 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 one of the most amazing uh, imaginative exercises of the human community the way that we've responded to the possibility of God by creating a human institution like religion it's worth interrogating and celebrating, and I think that we did it with integrity. Uh, Jane Ellison, when you uh, thought about these uh, programmes, did you? was it very important to you that they had music, that they had interviews, and they weren't essentially um, a lecture in 20 parts? How did you go about approaching that? Yes, it was important. I mean, it was important that we drew on as wide a range of, of sources and writing as possible. It was very important that they had contributors uh, who could bring their own personal perspectives uh, and uh, the music, I think, provides some moments of reflection. And in a series like this, to be able to stop and pause and think for yourself, uh, I think was very important. And when you look at uh, the programmes around Paul Celan, for example, uh, and the, the, the whole literature of the Holocaust, you, you really do need to be able to, to take a time out. Uh, and I felt the theme tune throughout the series uh, enabled listeners to, to do that. So Richard Holloway, when you were making this series, was it... Um and did you basically illustrate a thesis that you thought through, or was this in part for you a journey of exploration? I continue to struggle with these deep issues. I defy you to find anyone who doesn't, unless they've absolutely got an, a made-up mind about them. And one of the things that the series tries to do is to explore that broad range of attitude to these big questions that can't absolutely settle on one of the poles of reference. Either there is a God and we know a lot about him, or we know there's no God and so there's no ultimate meaning. I suspect that many people are poised on a kind of ledge of indecision between these two points of view. That, to me, is the religious quest. Let, Let me touch on Spinoza, who was mentioned rather pejoratively. Spinoza was a Jew. Spinoza was excommunicated by the synagogue, not by Christianity. And one of the points that we were making in that program is that because religion can be so defensive, some of the most challenging and most honest people are persecuted by the religious because they're saying things that are too uncomfortable for them to hear. And he's the supreme example of that. We were trying to explore what it is in the psychology of religion that makes people so defensive they run away from challenge. My thanks to Richard Holloway and to Jane Ellison. 
Next week, we have little doubt that we will be speaking to Adrian Van Claveren, the controller of BBC Five Live. Since we last spoke to him, many of his producers have been settling into their new Salford home before setting off south again for Wimbledon and the London Olympics. The BBC Trust has also sent the controller an end-of-term report in the form of a service review. Feedback listeners have written their own reports. Here are a few examples. Hello, my name's Andrew. Um, the question I would like to ask is particularly with the 9am slot, but not exclusively, why is the subject chosen? Always the knee-jerk dog whistle uh, topic from the previous day. Um, it seems to invite the most ill-informed um, to produce more um, heat than life. There's very, very seldom anybody on who is qualified to voice an opinion on whatever the topic is, um, and that's when it's not football. Hi, I'm Nick Evans. We're really looking forward to the coverage of the Olympics, but I was wondering if there was going to be anything put in place in case the weather was inclement. I wonder if you could enlighten us on that. Thank you. My name is Tom Lines in Brighton. As a regular listener to Radio 5 Live, I'm concerned about what seems to be its age profiling. It seems to be full of 30-somethings who chat to each other. This is fine for them, but it excludes people of other ages. And it doesn't make sense in a station that is about general news and the BBC's only national sports station. There's no need for the BBC to do age profiling because it's not a commercial uh, company. Uh, so why does it do this and what, what will the controller do to stop it in order to broaden the range of interest of Radio 5 Live? We will endeavour to ask him next week. But on the subject of the BBC's unique status, is the corporation becoming rather more commercial? Consider the evidence. Earlier this week, it was reported that the boss of the World Service, Peter Horrocks, had encouraged his staff to come up with some money-making ideas. Then on Thursday, the independent newspaper published an article headed BBC Looks to Woman's Hour for Revenue. The paper claimed that the iconic programme's editor had told her team that she will be devoting a significant segment of her workload to developing commercial projects linked to the show. It seems she's thinking of roadshow events, books and DVDs. Woman's Hour, in other words, is to be developed as a commercial brand, the paper said, to maximise revenues for the cash-strapped broadcaster. So what is going on? The BBC gave us this statement. We can assure Radio 4 listeners that commercial considerations play no part in decisions to commission programmes, nor do they influence the choice of items on programmes such as Woman's Hour. However, for many years, the commercial sale of CDs and the licensing of books have helped supplement network budgets. Any commercial value Women's Hour output creates is put back into programmes. Do send us any questions you may have about the BBC's commercial policy, or about Five Live, or about any other BBC station, to feedback, PO Box 67234, London SE1P, 4AX, or you can leave a phone message on 03 333 444. Standard landline charges apply, but it could cost more on some mobile networks. Or you can email feedback at bbc.co.uk. All those details are on our website. Now, before we go any further, I've had a complaint about last week's programme. Well, about me, actually. Listener Richard Bentley wrote, all the way from British Columbia, to say, I was listening to feedback on the 22nd of June and heard Roger Bolton mention the year as 2012. A simple question. When was the Battle of Hastings? 1066 or 1066? When are BBC Radio and TV presenters going to call the year 2012? Well, I'm sorry, Richard, I just don't like saying 2012 or 2012. Well, I need that and. But there was something in that section of my script that was undoubtedly incorrect. Did anyone notice? Is the Pope a Catholic? Hi, it's Bryn Jones here from Nantwich in Cheshire. I was listening to feedback on the radio over the weekend and I heard Roger talking about Ben Cooper, the new controller of Radio 1, who apparently started his job in October 2012. Since Ben Cooper took over as controller in October 2012... I was a bit surprised at that, considering we're only in June 2012. I was wondering whether the fact that Radio 1 is in a time warp would explain why I don't understand anything that happens on it. Thank you to Bryn Jones and to Rory Heap, who also spotted the error. 
Ben Cooper, of course, took office in October 2011. Or should that be 2011? And though, of course, quite mortified, I'm very glad that you are paying such close attention. Now, the websites of all the radio stations are about to undergo a major overhaul. They will look different, and they will behave differently too. But for better or worse... Some of you have already had a sneak peek at what is called a beta version of the sites. In other words, a test version which runs alongside the old site for a while to give brave, intrepid users the chance to try it out and tell the designers what they think. We wanted to give you the chance to tell the designers what you think too. But websites aren't the easiest thing to talk about on the radio. So I conjured up an imaginary assistant to help me on my journey into the future. Hello, Roger. My computer guide, Val 9000. Together we went to talk to Mark Friend, the controller of multi-platform and interactive for BBC Audio and Music, and I started by asking him about the new style to the Radio 4 website. Can you describe what it looks like, what, you, what look you've tried to get? What we're doing with the backgrounds on each of the networks is to reflect the the colours that relate to that network. So for Radio 4, we have uh, a blue background. We're looking at these very carefully to make sure that they work for the audience. The New Look websites use bold blocks of colour. While the template is the same for every station, the colours vary. Radio 4 is in the dark blue of its logo. Radio 3 is red. Radio 1 is purple. Radio 2 goes for orange. So you can get vastly more information on the page, so much of it illustrated by photographs. Yes, yeah, so we've got five, effectively five tabs. As you click on the right arrow here... Ah, so actually, it's a sort of like a slide screen. I thought there were only six pictures, but when you've pressed something, you've slid the picture across, and here's another six. The central section of each new site moves left to right when you click on the arrows on either side, rotating like a carousel. Each time it rotates, it brings up programmes relating to a new category. In Radio 4's case, highlights, factual, comedy, drama and what's on live. Tim Hitchcock. This new design forgets that people who want intelligent speech radio are probably less wowed by pretty pictures than functionality and clear routes to information. Function buttons such as Schedule, Program Website Finder and Main Menu Options should be much larger, clearer and generally more prominent. So, Mark Friend, in a way you've done one size fits all, haven't you? I mean, all of the different networks fit into the basic overall style and what our listeners are saying, Ready For is different. Get rid of lots of the pictures and fancy devices and give us the simple things that we need. So, you can, you can see what we're trying to do is to make it really consistent that any part of the BBC radio site that you're on, you can always get to your stations, your categories, your programme finder, your schedule and your favourites. Does that mean you can't personalise it? We absolutely can personalise it, Roger. Yeah. So what we put into each of these tabs on that homepage can be completely personal to Radio 4. And part of what we're working with through this beta is to work out how to adapt this for different types of audience and their expectations. So you can see on here what we're doing with Radio 4. This is very simple right now, just with a big image and some information. What I can't see is, for a start, I can't see a, a lettering system, A to Z. So if I wanted feedback, for example, I would have gone F. Now I can't do that. So how do I find feedback on this? So the easiest way to find feedback will be to go to the programme finder. Above the central carousel section of the website is a navigation panel. You have five options. When you click on any of these, a drop-down box appears. Click on Program Finder and type in Feedback. Press Enter and... Let's pause while we hold our breath. Pause here. And there we are. The connection and it takes you to the feedback. The quite page. stunning feedback page. Well, that didn't take too long. Now, you've made clear that this is a trial uh, period, uh, and yet um, two of your websites, BBC Asian Network and Five Live Sports Extra, have already gone over to the new style. So why is that? And are you really taking on board listeners' views or are the big decisions basically made? Yeah, we, Those uh, two sites that you mentioned were, were long overdue for a refresh. And when we looked at refreshing them, rather than do something that only lasts for six months maybe before we replaced it, we decided to jump straight to this. It doesn't stop us from changing things again uh, as part of it. This is a genuine attempt to try and understand what our users think of what is quite a big change. My name is Julia Cox and I live in Milton Keynes. Fortunately, as part of my job running a B&B, I get to listen to Radio 4 a lot, which is great because I love it. 
I also love my iPad, though, and that comes in handy as well, except the two don't work together properly all the time. So this means I can listen to programmes retrospectively, but not live. It's really frustrating. Is she doing anything wrong, or is that a fact that you can, on, a, on, a, on an iPad, you can listen to a programme retrospectively, but not live? Yes, there are some issues at the moment, and it's something we're working through, through this beta product. Mm. We're working through... Our, our ambition is that by the autumn, every single station from the BBC, all 55-odd stations, uh, will be completely accessible, live and on demand, uh, via an iPad uh, an iPhone. What's next after this? What's coming up in two, three, four years' time? Developing uh, the live radio experience, which we've done... You know, we've done some things with on Radio 1 already very successfully, but there's a lot more we can do with that. Um, so, for example, the ability to control your listening experience and rewind back to things you've missed easily, just as an example. Did you miss that, Roger? We rewind back to things you've missed easily, just as an example. Um, those are all the kinds of innovation that we want to bring to this. Rewinding live radio, the shape of things to come. My thanks to Mark Friend... And, of course, to Val 9000, who can shut down now. I'm sorry, Roger. I'm afraid I can't do that. Well, I can. And if you would like to have a look at the new Radio 4 site, just go to the current site and click on the Radio Beta banner at the top. You can then press on the orange button marked Feedback and tell Mark Friend what you think of the redesign. And finally, we end on a subject which divides the feedback audience, uh, but which a certain Mr Humphreys has no doubt about whatsoever. How I sympathise with John Humphreys, says Julie Webb. Hooray for John Humphreys, says Chris Allende. But Bruce Cartwright disagrees. Please, please don't pursue this stupid notion. <sighs> Fred, we're going to. What could it be? The debate over the wisdom of issuing eurobonds? An analysis of Ashley Cole's missed penalty. No, it's much more important than that. It is the use of the present tense to describe the past. Well, we've discovered that the settlement where they were living, they're killing their animals uh, in greater numbers for the midwinter than the midsummer. Uh, Stonehenge itself is also part was, of... Was, sorry, forgive me, I do hate sorry, this historic present. Go on, was, anyway. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> no room for doubt there. Goodbye. Well, Guy Hedgeco in Madrid. I don't know if you can hear us and uh, add the Madrid view. Can you can you hear us, Guy? No, he can't. Well, Pat Archer, he, uh... Radio Four Today program, twenty seventh of June, six eleven a.m. There has been no real ceasefire in in Syria. Also, the um, hauling. Oh. Uh, Imogen, we've got a problem on the line uh, to Geneva, uh, which is making it impossible to hear you. So we'll, we'll see if we can sort that out, but let's move on for the moment. We heard her all right, but she was sunny. <laughs> Very strange by the end. Mark Heal, yet another dropout. Radio 4, today programme at 0754 on the 25th of June. But that kind of gesture would be the sort of reassurance that might help. The other... Oh. Um, yeah, we're just getting one or two little glitches on the line there. Good work, oh. spotters. Keep listening, and when our dossier is bulging at the seams, which I don't think will be long, we will hand it over to the BBC and ask, ever so politely, of course, what's going on? And now from technological to more philosophical inquiries. Francis Bacon said, If a man will begin with certainties, he shall end in doubts. That seems to have happened to Richard Holloway. Once Bishop of Edinburgh, he now describes himself as an after-religionist. He has just completed a 20-part Radio 4 series called Honest Doubt. This is a download from the BBC. To find out more and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk. Hello. Faith which does not doubt is dead faith, said the Spanish writer and philosopher Miguel de Unamuno. Former Bishop Richard Holloway, presenter of Radio 4's 20-part series Honest Doubt, would doubtless agree. This week sees the end of his series, in which he charted the struggle between religious faith and doubt. Some listeners undoubtedly switched off. I've been really disappointed about what could have been a, a really good series examining doubt and faith and apologetics, and really it's far more like a one-sided attack on Christianity. 
and the church and the Bible and anything Christian getting nothing but unchallenged criticism. But many, many of us were in no doubt that Richard Holloway's series was a major broadcasting achievement. Later in the programme, we'll put your views to the feisty Mr Holloway himself. Also this week, some doubt surrounds the revamp of all BBC Radio's websites. Hello, Roger. Hello. Well, with the help of my imaginary computer assistant, I'll be visiting computer controller Mark Friend to find out just what website changes are in store. But first, the silences that are appearing all over the BBC like a rash. Last week, you may remember, we launched Operation Dropout. Following listener reports that programmes were falling off air and correspondents disappearing into the ether with increasing and alarming regularity, we asked you to join us in a sort of 21st century mass observation. Mike Thompson didn't realise there was a problem. He tweeted at BBC R4 Feedback to say, I just thought that the Today programme had gravitated to cutting people off rather than constantly interrupting. Not yet, Mike. Not yet. The feedback listener's response has, as usual, been quite magnificent. Hercule Poirot would have been proud of you. Rob Williams. I spotted a dropped call on PM on Friday the 22nd at 17.22, or thereabouts, during an interview about the Euro. Now here's Guy Hedgeco in Madrid. Hello. 